I just feel I've been exceptionally lucky and, and to have had as many opportunities as we've had. And they have been a remarkable number of opportunities. Just happen to have been at the right place, the right time, and be selected for some of these things. And that's been exhilarating. It's made for a most interesting life from my view, and it's not over yet. We're still doing things here and hope to have more impact. I don't get up every morning and look in the mirror and say, you know, think about myself as some big deal. I do what everybody else does, get up and shave in the morning and, and, uh, and go about my business, and that's it. He grew up in New Concord, a small town in eastern Ohio. In the America of the 1920s, New Concord was a very typical Midwestern town, and it instilled in John Glenn values that would last a lifetime. Looking back on it now, it was almost an idyllic place, I think, to have a childhood. There was a great religious influence in town, several churches in town, and there were parades on Memorial Day and the 4th of July and all the other uh, special days of the year, Armistice Day as it was called then, which is Veterans Day now. Patriotism and, and feelings about the country were just a given. You expected that. It wasn't something that was rare. His boyhood life was, as he puts it, something that might have inspired a Norman Rockwell painting. But as the decade moved toward its end, the Great Depression changed everything. And the conversation he overheard his parents having was something he would never forget. I remember very vividly one of the most impressive conversations I ever heard from my parents. And my dad was talking about he thought the mortgage was going to be foreclosed on our home. We were going to lose it. And I'll tell you, that struck terror into my 10 or 11 year old heart. Shortly after that is when uh, one of the Roosevelt programs of the FHA was put in, where you could get a longer uh, time period on your loan from the bank, guaranteed by the government. And my dad was able to renegotiate the loan to that longer loan, and we didn't lose our home. And it meant that the government's programs at that time were taking care of a of a, a danger or a, a problem that we all face together all over the country. And uh, I think that uh, not only affected me then, it affected my political thought later in life also. And to further cement in John Glenn's mind what good government and citizenship should be, he took to heart what he learned in a favorite high school class. When I had a, a teacher in high school that really affected my later life. His name was Harford Steele. And uh, Harvard Steele taught a course that was called Civics at that time, which was the study of government and politics. And he was a wonderful teacher. He just made the whole thing come alive. And I used to really look forward to his classes. He looked forward to enrolling at Muskingum College, perhaps to study chemistry and pre-med. Attending classes there would keep him in town, near family, friends, and the love of his life. And he's been it. We've been together ever since we were in, in uh, junior high school. Our parents used to kid us that we were together in playpens together, and we really were. And when we got to uh, about junior high age where kids start sort of pairing off a little once in a while, why uh, from then on it was uh, the two of us together. He had always loved the idea of flying. He took his first airplane ride at eight and was hooked. His dream of flying was tempered by the cost of lessons, which he couldn't afford. But one day he saw a message on a college bulletin board. The federal government would pay for civilians to take lessons and get their pilot's licenses. John Glenn couldn't pass it up. So I took that in the middle of my junior year and drove back and forth to a little town, New Philadelphia, which was about 50 miles away. And uh, that's where I first soloed a, a small light airplane, that uh, Taylor Craft, about 65 horsepower engine. And so that was great. I, I thought I had gone to heaven at that time. <laughs> I really liked it, really enjoyed it. And then Pearl Harbor occurred on December 7th, 41. And so I had my pilot's license and I thought that that'd be a natural to go into military flight training. My dad and mother weren't too keen for me dropping out of school at that time, but uh, it was what I thought I, it was my duty to do and I did it. He went through naval flight training and requested a commission in the Marine Corps. He got his wings and became a lieutenant. He was stationed in the Marshall Islands and flew 59 missions. Following the war, he continued to serve his country in the Marine Corps, first in a squadron in China, and later stateside to train pilots and hone his own skills by flying the latest military aircraft. By 1952, he was a major, and once again, the country was at war in Korea. He flew combat missions in support of the troops on the ground, and was known because of the enemy planes he shot down as the MiG-Mad Marine. 
uh, flying, setting up screens up along the Yalu River against the MiGs that kept coming down from Manchuria and that, uh, through North Korea, trying to get down to hit our aircraft and our troops down closer to the fronts. And that's where the, the famous MiG battles of the Korean War occurred, was up along the Yalu. The Korean War ended. And while he and Annie could look forward to serving in peacetime and raising their two children, David and Lynn, John Glenn continued to look for new challenges in the sky. As one of the nation's premier test pilots, he decided as part of a program to test jet engines at high speed to try and break the cross-country speed record. And he did. We had two planes assigned to do this, and then uh, three in-flight refuelings set up cross-country. So we broke the record by quite a bit, by 20 minutes or so, and it was, we crossed from, from Los Alamitos, uh, California, to uh, Floyd Bennett Field in New York in three hours and 23 minutes. To be exact, 3.23, 8.4 seconds was the official time. <laughs> that was a project that was enough fun. I'd like to go back and do it again today. This flight was the beginning of a new life for John Glenn, a more public life. America was at war again, but this time it was the Cold War an ideological battle with the Soviet Union. And one of the fronts in this war was outer space and the race to conquer it. The Soviets at that time had been claiming technical research superiority to the United States. We knew that they were not superior to us technically, but while they were doing this, they had been able to orbit a vehicle, several, and we, of course, had ours blowing up on the launch pad. We wanted to make sure that the world knew that we really were the superior nation. Our leadership was not a fluke. And uh, that was sort of what the, it was all about. The, the manned space program was born out of the Cold War. He was one of the seven original Mercury astronauts. The space race was on. The Russians won the first round as Yuri Gagarin flew one orbit around the Earth. John Glenn would not be the first American in space. Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom's suborbital flights were successful preludes to an American orbiting the Earth. And that man would be John Glenn. It was February 20th, 1962. He was traveling at 17,545 miles per hour, taking just under five hours to complete three orbits around the Earth in his Friendship 7 spacecraft. There was drama in his return to Earth due to a loose heat shield. And as the world held its breath, John Glenn plunged back to Earth, splashed down safely, and became a part of history. There were parades in New York and New Concord, and addressed to a joint session of Congress. The adulation of an entire country was given to a man everyone saw as a hero. People have asked me before any one outstanding thing that you say was more remarkable than anything else in your life. Obviously, that's one of the high points. There are other high points, too. There are other high points, like when you're in combat, and you see people get shot down. And uh, some of those things are seared into your memory forever. And so some of those things are every bit as memorable to me as, uh, as the space days were. But certainly the, the space program was so new and different. And we did, hadn't, didn't have any real experience. So we were sort of feeling our way a little bit. There's three times around. We look at that now as, as being sort of elementary. But that's where we really started and started working out all the problems that we uh, were still working on today. John Glenn wanted to return to space. But unbeknownst to him, President Kennedy didn't want America's most famous astronaut to risk his life on another flight. And so with no new missions in sight, he turned his energies in a direction inspired by Harford Steele, the civics teacher he had admired so much from his days in high school. I had thought about politics and government work sometime, but I had no idea that I ever would be able to do that myself. I'd looked at my space days and my military days as being days where I'd contributed a lot to this country. I was proud of my, my combat service I'd had in, in World War II and in Korea, uh, proud of the test work I had done and of the being able to contribute in orbital flight. And if I wasn't to continue in that area, uh, where could I do the best and uh, do the best for the country? And uh, that's where I decided to run for public office. John Glenn seemed like the perfect candidate, just the right man to run for the U.S. Senate from his home state of Ohio in 1964. But a head injury from a fall ended his campaign soon after it began. Glenn ran again for the Senate in 1970 and lost. 
In 1974, on his third try, he won in a landslide and began a career in public office that would span 24 years. People. He approached his work in the Senate in a very practical way. Based on his expertise and skills, where could he be the most effective? He knew firsthand the horrors of war, which led him to fight for the successful passage of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act in 1978. And there was his work in making government more efficient and more accountable. It was my legislation basically that established the inspectors general in all of the different major departments and agencies of government. And we put the CFOs in that were responsible for how the money was spent each year and what was efficient, what was not, and worked out uh, uh, some of the problems with uh, with budgeting and with comptrollership in the Defense Department, for instance, and, and trying to work out supporting legislation uh, so we had more efficient use of our, our money there. John Glenn's view of public service excludes the notion of political extremes. He's a man who represents what he calls the sensible center and sees that as the place where most Americans reside. His years in the Senate reflected this idea. As the political landscape skewed to far right and far left, he took less pleasure in the give and take of the process. But before he decided against running for a fifth term, his work for the Committee on Aging led him to a discovery that would get him the one thing that he had been denied over 30 years ago, a second flight into space. With my background in space every year, when the consideration on the Senate floor for NASA uh, would be coming up, uh, I usually would do what you call floor manage that bill I did for a number of years. In preparing for that, I noticed NASA had determined that there were about 52 different changes in the human body that occur in space over a period of time, over a number of days in space. Many of those, or a number of those, are very similar to what happens in the process of aging right here on Earth. John Glenn had an idea. What if he could return to space as a human guinea pig on the space shuttle? and conduct experiments that would contribute to a better understanding of the aging process. It turns out the NASA doctors had wanted to do this for some time. The director of NASA, Dan Golden, at that time, the administrator, uh, put this house for study in the scientific community for about a year. And uh, people that were interested in this came back, and it turns out they were unanimous in their view that, yes, this would be a good thing to look into. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. It was October 29, 1998, when John Glenn made his long-awaited second journey into space. I was payload specialist number two on this. I wasn't in flight command or anything like that, of course. Each one of us had our assignments on these projects. What we had was a head net at all the, the brain waves, the heart rate, the lung volume. We measured 21 different parameters for about a four-day period there. That was the purpose of the uh, second flight. I loved it. I'd like to go up every day. <laughs> The next chapter in John Glenn's life began at the Ohio State University. His papers would find a place there, and so, it turns out, would he. An institute of public affairs and public policy with his name on it would seek to engage and inspire young people to become part of the political process. How do you inspire citizenship? How do you make our young people give them a feeling of, of pride in, in community, in state and country, to where they're willing to go out and, and uh, engage in political activity, be a member of a party, be active. The promise of the Institute and its goals have helped it evolve into the John Glenn School of Public Affairs. It represents a unique legacy for a man whose passion for his country and the true meaning of democracy are among his most steadfast beliefs. The purpose of our school here to me is to, to help this country develop in the future in, in two ways. We inspire citizenship, number one. And then two, the second part of it is developing leadership. It's that kind of willingness to serve that gives our whole country a feeling of, of oneness, of cohesiveness, where we're not just splintering off in different directions like some of the other, other countries do. And I think this is key for the future to getting us all working together again. And if we can, can do that, uh, then we'll be doing a, a great job for our, not only our state, but our country right here. Somebody told me once that the, uh, they'd rather burn out than rust out, and I think that's the reason that just keeps me going, because I, I, I couldn't think of anything more boring than just sitting around doing nothing. <laughs>